Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Her office is responsible for 2.5, an average of 2.5 trillion bank transactions a year. That actually breaks down to almost 7 billion transactions a day. I'm completely in awe, and I couldn't even find a calculator that would actually give me that amount, but I figured it out finally, and I am delighted to be joined today by the California State Treasurer, Fiona Ma. That's just unfathomable, just in terms of one piece of what your office does. So I think the basic question has to be, what is the state treasurer's office responsible for? Yes. So actually, post-COVID now, um, we've taken about $3.7 trillion. Oh my gosh. I know. That number has been going up. Um, so I'm the banker. All the money comes into my office. I also uh, invest the state's short-term portfolio as well as the short-term investments for about 2,300 local government units. Mm -hmm. And I also sell all the bonds for the state of California, the UC, and the CSU system. So that's like the banking side. Then over the years, I don't know if you remember Speaker Jess Unruh, mm -hmm. when he became treasurer, he said, oh my God, we're sitting on so much money, we should be doing more. So now I fund and finance affordable housing, public transportation, schools, um, affordable housing, uh, green energy, garbage and recycling, advanced manufacturing. I oversee four savings programs, and that's just within the treasurer's office. All right, so something must have attracted you to this position, because I don't think there would have been anything more terrifying in my world for someone to say you're responsible for finances and for investments and for distributions of funds. That would have just been, uh, let me work on Parks and Rec. Um, so what, what was it about being state treasurer that appealed to you and what did you think you could bring to the office? So I am a certified public accountant by training a tax accountant in real estate. And so my parents were really happy when I got my bachelor's in accounting and my master's in taxation. Then I started my own practice and I became president of a small business association. And then I started veering toward public service and thinking, oh, I want to help people. Maybe I want to run for office. So my parents were not happy. So eight years later, my parents moved to Las Vegas. I was able to run for office and I ran for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Now, that is kind of terrifying. I'm good with numbers, but all of a sudden, you know, you're out there, it's policy, you have to go in and fight, you know, every day in City Hall, and then your constituents are always calling you. So then I got elected to the State Assembly, again, out of my wheelhouse. It took a long time for me to kind of get into the flow. I'm not an attorney, and so, you know, that's all about legislation and laws. And then I ran for the State Board of Equalization. Mm. So now, that has to do with taxes, mm -hmm. sales taxes. We heard uh, appeals, income tax appeals, sales tax appeals. So that was a little bit better. And now, as State Treasurer, I'm kind of comfortable uh, in this position, having done all those other positions and my background. And actually, when you were elected state treasurer, you, you made history for a few reasons. First of all, you mentioned one of those very upfront. You're a CPA by trade. You were the first woman of color in that position. And you are the first, uh, you actually uh, won by a huge amount of the vote. Obviously, that must have felt pretty profound at the time. You've been in the office working since 19, now kind of looking back at that. Um, what does it mean to you to have those designations and to have that sort of uh, honor of being in that, that category of yeah. history? Um, I think the voters appreciate that I do have a, a accounting and finance background, uh, but because of everything I've been doing, I know where the pots of money are. Right. I know who to call to get things done. I came from the private sector and now in the public sector, so focused on streamlining and, and making things easier for the constituents. And I go around the state. I love to travel. If you follow me on social media, I go everywhere and post everything that's amazing about this state. But while I'm out there, people want to know. I want to come to California. I want to expand. Today we are at Rivian in Irvine and they want to expand, right? But for tax incentives, tax credits, you know, they're like, why, you know, is it so hard? Or, you know, why don't we have more for this if we're gonna be this e-mobility, um, you know, state? And so those are some of the questions that I have to answer and then I have to relay back uh, to the governor, uh, to the people that 
work for me in terms of trying to find buckets of money, trying to incentivize people, companies to stay here in California and grow here and be a little bit happy to pay the sunshine tax, right? I know people complain about that, but where else would you want to live? You know, I was going to I was going to ask that a little bit later on, but you've you've opened the door for it. Um, California is very progressive in a lot of ways. It has a lot of hopes and dreams for the future and for the health and well-being of all of the populace here in California, but with that comes a price tag. And there have been a lot of grumblings that, you know, those price tags uh, are prohibitive for business and people are taking business out of the state and there's, you know, obviously nuance is imperative when you talk about this, but how do you make those balance and how would you speak to someone who says, I'm getting out of California because it's too expensive to do business here while we're trying to make these moves towards a cleaner, healthier, and more hospitable environment. Yeah. So I always tell the business sector, I said, listen, do you know who your assembly member is? Do you know who your senator is? Have you gone down to your city council? Do you know who your city council member is? Right? And if the answer is no, then how are they supposed to know what the struggles are, what the difficulties are, things that need to change in order to make their lives easier uh, so that they can stay here? So that's what I do. I challenge a lot of the business people that say, oh, it's so difficult. Don't you understand? And I say, not really. Right? So get involved, number one. Number two, every state has to balance its budget, right? So people talk about Texas. Well, Texas property taxes can go up and down every single year, so it could fluctuate. We have Prop 13 here, so at least you know you're not going to lose your home because property values have gone up. So, you know, there's these little um, nuances to the tax law, even though people think, oh, I wanna move to Florida, I wanna move to Texas, I wanna move to Arizona. Well, it is hot right mm -hmm. now, okay? Um, it is may not be as diverse as we have here in California. Uh, we have a lot of entrepreneurs, we have great higher education uh, institutions, uh, people wanna come here, they wanna get things done. I mean, this is the land of Silicon Valley and Hollywood and, um, you know, uh, biotech now and uh, electric vehicles and hydrogen. I mean, everything that's happening that's cutting edge is still happening here first in California. And to your point, obviously large, diverse, highly populated, it is what, the fourth largest economy? Or are we fifth, fifth or fourth? Fifth or fourth, where we're, we're I mean, in the world. I mean, you're, world. it's literally a country unto itself. Exactly. And so all of those issues have to be addressed. How do we remain, I mean, first of all, how is that determined? How is that designation of fifth and or fourth economy uh, yeah, determined? It, it's usually the uh, gross domestic product, so okay. how much money um, the country takes in. So Germany still takes in a little bit uh, more than we do, but we are definitely catching up. Oh, wow. Okay. And then when it comes to uh, making sure that we move progressively forward while still making sure that it's healthy for us, where does the treasurer's office come in? I mean, you're not responsible for choosing the taxes, but you're responsible for you know managing and collecting and all those sort of things. So how does that all work out? Yeah, so let's take affordable housing. Okay. I oversee the tax credits and the bonds. And so when I first started, uh, I decided to combine the two agencies because the left hand wasn't really talking to the right hand. Mm. And if we're trying to get the bonds and the tax credits out to build affordable housing quicker, we need to better align. So we have one application now, all the terminology aligns, all the deadlines for filing align now. And so that makes it much easier for the developers uh, to come in and apply for these tax credits. So that's like just one example, but everything I do, I went to visit some crisis stabilization units today and being able to see what they're doing, work with them, because a lot of them sometimes have difficulty in meeting uh, the deadlines, getting their permits done. Uh, sometimes it's neighborhood opposition. And so we have to be open to that and say, okay, we get it. You know, one had eagles, like an eagle uh, that was nesting on their property. So, oh. so they couldn't uh, do any new construction, right? So we have to 
be a little bit more flexible instead of saying, I'm sorry, you didn't make your deadline, we're going to pull back the money. We're like, okay, we we'll get it. We'll wait for the eggs to hatch. We'll wait for the <laughs> eggs to hatch, probably in August, and then, you know, we can get back to the drawing board. So that's what I uh, bring to the table is constituent services, trying to be a little bit more understanding to real life uh, happenings out in the community and not to be so like strict and rigid about these deadlines that we artificially set in government. How many people work in, in your office? Um, I have about 425 people. Okay, okay. So everybody obviously has their area of expertise, but you overseeing everything, what have you found to be the thing that people don't really know as well as they should about what the California State Treasurer's Office can and cannot do? Yeah, so we offer a lot of resources through my office, whether it's small business loans. Uh, we rolled out a lot of grants during the pandemic. Um, we issue bonds, and so a lot of people don't know that if you need money, maybe come to my office and we can help you, guide you, steer you, um, advise you, right? And so that is what I've been doing uh, during the pandemic, post-pandemic, trying to get these resources out to the community so at least it's on their mind. For example, accessory dwelling units. Those are buildings. ADUs. Everybody's got them. ADUs. Well, did you know that we had offered $40,000 in grants, free money, to people who wanted to put an ADU. Was there a limit as to how many of those 40,000 there were? Um, yeah, I mean, it was out of money, but okay. I'm just saying, right. if, if nobody tells you that no. the money's available, also, did you know that we provided free down payment assistance for first time home buyers, up to 20% of the value of the house? Yep, that program opened and closed in two weeks, but the governor has now um, put in more money for ADUs as well as for these first time home buyer programs. So I'm here telling the public, if you want to do an ADU or you want uh, need free down payment assistance, it's coming. So when it's something like free payment, uh, free down payment assistance, first time buyers, is there a economic qualifier? You have to make less than or more than, or you have to have a certain amount of monthly income, or you have to have a house, or uh, sorry, you have to be in a certain geographic area, or that kind of thing. Yes, I mean there's all sorts of uh, rules and regulations. So Got it. you just have to go on the website. Um, they publicize it usually before the money is available. So you have to prepare yourself too, because by the time you hear it on the news or see it in the newspaper, the money's probably gone. Right. So we need to do a better job in government of letting people know that these resources are available and when they're coming and to prepare um, people. When we first were talking, you were talking about the fact that you've learned about the office and what's available, what is there, and that there's monies to be used for good. And I know that you personally have initiated uh, some programs to help different, you know, foster youth, et cetera, and your different policies and, you know, young, especially in, you know, focused on the youth of California to help them grow in a more robust, prosperous way. What are some of the things that you put into place that you are very proud of? Yeah, so we oversee four savings programs. Um, so the budget starts with the governor and then the legislature has a role in tweaking the budget. And once it's set, they will give me money to administer the program. So one of our newest programs is called the HOPE Accounts. So this is for any child who lost a parent or guardian due to COVID oh. or longtime foster youth in the system for 18 months or more. They will be eligible for free money in their child savings accounts to compound and grow. So when they turn 18, they can go to college or uh, go through a certified apprenticeship program. So that's a new program. We're working on the regs right now. Um, Cal Kids, every newborn right now can get anywhere from $100 to $150 in their child savings account, again, to grow for their college education. And then any first through 12th grader on free and reduced lunch, they are eligible for $500. If they're a foster youth, another $500. And if they're homeless, another $500. So this is $1,500 in free money that's available. And we are desperately trying to get the word out so parents and guardians can go on the website calkids.org and just uh, click that this is our child or you know um, this person you know is is here and interested and then that money will start growing so thank you for allowing me to talk about some of these free money programs to help our next generation well and I also think about how complex is it for the average citizen to go online and fill I mean has have they been uh, have the templates been created that that shouldn't be so f 
intimidating to actually do this? Yes, it's it's very, very easy, like for CalKids, the free money, like for babies, calkids.org. It walks you through it. It is very, very simple. And there's an 800 number. There's an email if you get stuck. And so there is a lot of help, also in different languages. California, being as uh robust as it is in a lot of different urban areas, you're sitting here in Los Angeles. How closely do you work with the cities? How does, how does that division of state and city work when it comes to budgets, money, finances, opportunities, et cetera? Um, I, I do invest for 2,300 local government units, so okay. they give me their excess cash and I invest, so I'm able to keep track or be in touch with local governments. The more money they give me, I know that they're doing well. If they're withdrawing money, I know that they may be um, you know, in cash flow difficulty. So that's one way for me to track. Um, the other ways are you know, obviously giving money away for all these different uh, programs. A lot of them depend on local funding uh, to meet that capital stack. So constantly working, I just was on the phone with a member of the uh, Board of Supervisors uh, in San Mateo today talking about an affordable housing project. So people know to call me, to check in, to ask about the process or you know, whether their project looks like it's a good project or what else they need to do or um, you know, who they need to reach out to for Caltrans, for example, right? They're trying to expand and they need their road expen expanded. Uh, they need more, um, more resources for a wastewater treatment plan. Who do they call? You know, so okay. that's kind of what I do, and that's my specialty. There was an influx of federal money, obviously, during the pandemic for emergency, and and you know now all those programs are are pretty much closing down, shutting down, and you know getting back to where they were. Um, and we were known as having a, an enormous surplus that we were extremely healthy. That we could, you know, there was a lot of conversation about funding programs that had uh, that needed the influx of cash or that uh, needed to become more robust and everything. And then there have been the oh, oh, but wait a minute, there's decreasing revenue predictions, and you know, are we really should we be doing that? Are we moving into a deficit? Should we be touching the reserve? So. Where are we? Okay, okay, so um, I was kind of surprised because, you know, COVID hit and I'm the bank, so I and 100 of my team members went to work every day because if the Bank of California closes, like, we all shut down. Sure. Um, so I was worried every day, many sleepless nights, but lo and behold, that first year, we saw a $46 billion surplus, which surprised me. But if you think about it, technology companies were doing well right? Hospitals, uh, people were, you know, using the medical system. Even though people were home, they were still spending a lot, buying cars and boats and RVs. So our sales taxes were pretty robust. And these companies were also uh, IPOing, issuing bonuses and stock options. People were opening up uh, Robinhood accounts and, you know, trading their stocks, right? A lot of activity was happening. Then the next year, $96 billion in surplus, which totally surprised me. And so what the governor did is decided to work with 120 members and said, what are those one-time projects in your district, those projects that you've been waiting to fund? What is it that you would need? And he basically you know, allocated the money based on that, um, those needs, as well as gave back money to the people twice. Uh, and then this year, we have about a $31 billion uh, deficit but $37 billion in rainy day funds. So the governor is not proposing to touch the rainy day funds this year, and hopefully more people are gonna file in October, October 15th, uh, they got an extension, hopefully more money comes in, and you know, if the federal government would hold on interest rates or reduce interest rates, that'll start stimulating the economy again, and then hopefully next year um, we'll be able to get back uh, to a surplus uh, position. So in the grand scheme of things, is $31 billion, I mean, in the fourth and or fifth largest economy in the world, is that, is that a small amount or a let's be cautious and thoughtful amount? Um, it is definitely a deficit, but we're not going to touch our rainy day funds. Okay. So that's this year. So we'll have to see what happens next year. Okay. And a lot of is what you just said is dependent upon whether you know the interest rates go up, what the feds do, you know, to slow down inflation. Yep, all of that. Okay, and things are looking 
a little quiet in that regard, actually. Uh, yes, they did not. Uh, they paused for this month, so that was a good sign. Okay. And where are we with, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation about environment. I mean, we're all kind of going through a lot right now with what we're seeing across the planet. Um, obviously, California has issues with wildfires in California. So where, where are we with supporting environmentally sound propositions for the future? You spoke about Rivian, Rivian being an electric car company. Um, where are we in that regard and in terms of supporting those progressive yes. ideas? Yes. So we passed Prop 32 uh, back in 2006, the uh, global... Uh, Warming Act of, of 2006, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor at the time, uh, and we started um, the trend to set that bar to reduce the emissions back uh, to, you know, pre-1996 like levels. Um, we have continued uh, through Governor Jerry Brown and now Governor Gavin Newsom to increase those uh, standards, those mandates. Uh, this governor has uh, done um, many executive orders, uh, just kind of raising the bar so that we are now the capital of the electric vehicle uh, world, right? His last mandate was uh, all passenger vehicles uh, sold have to be electric vehicles by 2035. So that means there's an influx of EV charging companies, uh, car manufacturers, battery storage. I mean, this is really where everything's happening. Uh, the state of California also passed two initiatives on stem cell uh, the, um, to advance uh, stem cell research. And because of that, we are the only state that is in this space that's actively, robustly funding uh, R&D at our uh, major universities. And all the top researchers and scientists are coming to California to try to figure out the next cure for that rare disease or cancer or Alzheimer's. So, you know, putting our money where our mouth is, um, setting those executive orders, uh, setting aside money for research and development really does make a difference. So those, I can tell you, are the two top uh, industries that is here and, you know, um, attracting a lot of attention. As Treasurer, you know, I'm asking a lot of policy questions and you're giving me some really interesting, very succinct answers, so I appreciate it. So obviously, you know, you definitely not only have garnered all this experience that you, you know, in these different positions you've had, but you also obviously stay very current on everything. So where are we with the things that are not so much fun? Where are we with homelessness and affordable housing and everything like that? Yeah, so affordable housing, uh, I think we were doing really well uh, up until the federal government started raising interest rates. We have approved more applications, uh, you know, in the last few years than, than ever before. Uh, this governor has also allocated $500 million in state low-income housing tax credits, which has enabled a lot of these projects to come off the shelf because of this extra funding. And then the federal government gave us two rounds of federal 9% disaster tax credits to rebuild in those areas. So we were doing really, really well, and then now interest rates have, have been going up, and it's much harder for these uh, housing projects to pencil. Um, the governor also had Project Room Key, Project Home Key, and so that is continuing. Uh, the, the state government is buying hotel rooms to try to house more homeless people, get them off the street into supportive services, and then uh, move, them, um, move them through. But again, it is not easy, right? We need more mental health crisis beds. Um, it's very hard to get an appointment uh, when you need to see a doctor, when you know your medication runs out and you're on the streets. Um, so we just have to, if we could get the interest rates lower, I think things would, uh, would, would, would start moving again very quickly. And many of these projects, including housing the homeless, uh, would be able to move much faster. Unrelated to all of these state subjects, uh, you also are a member of SAG-AFTRA. So did you dabble in, uh, in, in film and television at one point in time? Yes, I did. So when Willie Brown was the mayor of San Francisco, uh, Willie Brown is an avid movie critic. He would write a column and go to all the movies and talk about them. But he loved having movies in San Francisco. So we had tons of, of filming. Um, Robin Williams lived in San Francisco. Treasure Island was a film, big film studio. Uh, Nash Bridges was filming in San Francisco. Sure. And so I had a lot of 
uh, extra. I call them Taft-Hartley extra work, mm -hmm. and so I managed to do three Taft-Hartley projects, and you that's how card. I got my SAG card. However, I have my card since 2007, and I've never earned a penny, but I continue to pay the dues and stand with my brothers and sisters who are out there on the picket line I right was going to say that's one of the reasons that we have the good fortune of having you with us today is that you are standing in solidarity with, um, with the Writers Guild and with SAG-AFTRA. So what have you seen and heard out there? Uh, well, things have changed, right, post-COVID. Uh, a lot of streaming uh, companies have come online, a lot of contents building, and AI. For example, I did not know that, you know, the studios would like to use someone's likeness uh, in whatever format they want without paying them any residuals. Uh, and so that is kind of the fight about the future, right? Actors, writers, they're the creative ones. They're putting in their sweat and tears. They went to school for that, and then they're not getting fairly compensated. Yet the studios are making a lot of money, uh, all of them. And so this is what the fight is right now. Well, and of course, the entertainment industry at large is a critical industry here in Southern California. Absolutely. You know, the entertainment capital, but it's also a good tax resource and also a good draw for tourism and all sorts of things. So I imagine that there is a governmental tie over and above the individuals that are in the strike. So you, as you mentioned, began this life of service a while back. How, what, what is your belief that government offers to, you know, to the populace at large, but that also allows you to say, I'm giving my, I'm giving my time and energy and passions towards this pursuit? Yeah, I think, um, Government uh, does provide the safety net. I think that's first and foremost. And a lot of people always say, well, why doesn't government act more like business? And I said, well, when business is doing great, everyone has a job, that's great. But when the economy goes down, people get laid off, all of a sudden, they don't have a job, they don't have health care, they don't have retirement, and then who's going to assist them? That's government. So government and business are not alike, but we work hand in hand and it's important that both are doing their job so government needs to uh, be more uh, outward facing they need to be more constituent friendly um, we need to answer the phone we need to return people's emails because that's when people get upset is when government they're ignored ignored and they're not getting the services or the answers and so that's what I try to focus my office on is trying to make sure that we are accessible and available uh, I set up um, a, a website um, sorry an email uh, during COVID and people can still use it and that is ask Fiona at treasure.ca.gov and Catherine Asprey, that's her one job, is to make sure that she connects with constituents and make sure that they get the help that they need. Are you, are your parents now proud of the fact that you went into a life of government and are you, or a public service, I should say, actually? And you know, are you still enthusiastic and passionate about it? Yes, my father is finally proud that I am the treasurer of the fifth or fourth largest economy. So he does not bug me to go back and do uh, taxes again. Yes. Very cool. And do you want to continue? Um, I want to continue in public service. I'm not ready uh, to quit yet. Uh, so I am running for lieutenant governor in 2026 and look forward to the challenges. Uh, the lieutenant governor sits on the UC, CSU, and community college boards, chairs the Lands Commission, as well as sits on the Coastal Commission. So again, more environment. Uh, to uh, opportunities as well as improving our public education system. So I'm all about that. Very cool. All right, so if someone wants to find out uh, about the, uh, the, the treasurer's office and find out what you're doing and find out how they can access some of these programs that you have so generously shared with us today, what's the best way for people to find out? Yep, my website is www.treasurer.ca.gov. Everything is on my uh, website. Um, if they want to follow me for business, um, you know, grants and loans and, and programs, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Fiona Ma. And if you want to check out my dogs and my dad and my <laughs> husband and my family, then that's Instagram and Facebook. Very nice. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. This has been really, really wonderful. Thank you. And, and come back. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents.